Hello and welcome to Backyard Chickens. This evening we're going to be talking about raising chickens in your backyard and some helpful tips and tricks to get started. As we get started here, my name is Katie Bell and I'm a U of I Extension Educator located in Southern Illinois, serving the five Southern counties in Unit 26. So I serve Jackson, Franklin, Randolph, Perry, and Williamson counties. So a couple of things to start out with here. We're going to be talking about getting started with chicks, housing and protection for your flock, nutritional requirements throughout the lifespan, and then we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about breed selection and choosing the right type of chicken for you. So just to note in this picture here, this is our small flock that we keep at the office here in Jackson County. We have four hens and a rooster that we keep uh, mostly for grass management. They would be considered free range and we do collect some eggs from them as well. So I just wanna give kind of a brief history on how long our relationship with chickens and poultry have been going on throughout um, kind of both of our, throughout history. So chickens have been domesticated for nearly 10,000 years which means we've had them in our lives for, for nearly 10,000 years. Chickens were first brought to North America by European settlers, so they first kind of arrived here, um, as lots of other animals that we know today came, came with uh, European contact. Breeds were developed to fit the needs of those raising them. So when we think about that, chickens have been heavily uh, bred for specific purposes, and desired traits since we started domesticating them. And that's why many different breeds of chickens look very differently. Um, so we have chickens that are designed and bred for egg production, uh, fancy breeds, which are, we think of chickens that have really elaborate tail feathers and patterns um, to our game birds, which are gonna be our meat production type birds. So during World War II, chicken meat really rose to popularity with other livestock and meat shortages um, occurring more frequently. This led to kind of a revolution in chicken production. And that's whenever the Chicken um, of Tomorrow campaign was first uh, kind of started by AMP grocery store chain in the 1940s. So what this did was a really intensive um, breeding program that resulted in a very high yielding, high muscle, rapid growth breed of chicken that we still use today to produce a lot of our commercially available chicken meat. Um, and this was the Cornish Rock Cross. Um, now we have some other Cornish crosses that are our primary meat birds. Um, but this is a very genetic, uh, narrow genetic pool and they are specialized in their heavy, heavy muscling and rapid growth rate. And the reason that I talk about this kind of history and how um, chicken as we know them today is kind of developed is so that we have an understanding that our backyard chickens and the chickens that we're looking for to raise at home are going to look very different than these chickens and also perform and produce much differently than our kind of commercial chickens are. So just some considerations to think about if we're thinking about starting with chickens. Why do you want to raise chickens? What are your purposes? Um, you know, what, what are you looking for in, in chickens? Um, and I have here, you know, if, if you're planning on maintaining breed purity, um, you may need multiple enclosures, which is something people don't always think about. So if you're trying to raise chickens and get into chickens and have a specific breed and maintain those bloodlines, you may want to keep certain breeds of chickens separate from each other so you aren't crossing um, and creating hybrids. Um, in other situations, this is exactly what people want. We're looking for really fun combinations of chickens to change egg colors or um, you know some other reasons that we might be crossing breeds. But just think about your purposes for having chickens may dictate the kind of enclosures you have, um, the way that you keep them, um, and, and some tools that you might need. Another thing to think about, and this is going to be uh, vary depending on your location and, and nearness to town um, a lot of times, predator control is a, is a big deal. Uh, there's a lot of different options. Some work better than others. Um, I have some things listed. Uh, all of them have pros and cons. 
Um, dogs, so guardian dogs, a lot of us think of Great Pyrenees um, or other types of guardian dogs. These can work really well, but you have to go about uh, introducing them to the flock and make sure that they are okay with, with the flock of chickens and that they know that it's their job to take care of the chickens and not hurt the chickens. Because sometimes it, if a dog's not used to being around chickens, you can do just as much damage with a dog as you can without. So you wanna make sure that if you're getting a dog specifically for chicken protection, you wanna make sure that you properly socialize that animal to the flock and also recognize that dogs um, can vary wildly. Um, I know some Great Pyrenees are very, very good at taking care of backyard flocks and others um, are not. And so just that's a word of caution with, with dogs. Um, geese, some people purchase guardian geese. If you're going to purchase geese for protection, you want to typically you want to try to acquire them as goslings and just get one or two of them and really socialize them to the flock so that they know the flock is what they're supposed to be protecting and alarming on and that they stay with the flock. Fencing, fencing is usually a really good option, um, both to keep the animals close to home and also exclude predators. You can use um, many different kinds of fencing, including electric, but fencing, obviously the biggest drawback to it is the labor in building it and then also um, the expense of, of purchasing it. Alarms, uh, some people use like motion uh, sensing devices. So lights that kick on whenever animals move in and out or um, a noise maker, something like that. Often predators and local animals will become accustomed to them and desensitized to them and eventually they quit working. Um, and then I also put a radio on there uh, sometimes a radio or background noise of, of human voices can scare predators away, but just like the alarms, sometimes the animals get used to them and then they're not worried about it. Um, so another thing to think about overall, especially as we're coming into spring, is keeping chickens through the winter. Uh, hens typically need a minimum of 14 hours of light a day to continue to lay eggs. So that's something we don't always think about is that chickens are very um, connected to and, and kind of affected by the amount of daylight hours that we get. And so as light starts to become less and less as we go into winter, chickens will stop laying as many eggs. If we're trying to encourage our hens to keep laying, we want to have a light on a timer that stays on um, maybe a few hours in the evening or comes on earlier in the morning to provide that 14 hours of daylight length to keep our chickens going. If you're gonna be doing this, it really doesn't matter the, the kind of light that you use, as long as it's something that simulates the, the same kind of color uh, and tone as, as daylight. So a red light bulb does not work. Uh, you want something that has kind of a daylight effect to it. Um, if you're gonna do artificial lights, using a timer is very helpful. Uh, we just use like a cheap, uh, Christmas tree light timer that you can turn on to, to kick on. Uh, chickens can still be outside in the winter as long as they have adequate shelter. Uh, typically the most important thing is a windbreak and somewhere that you can keep their water from freezing. And then the other thing to keep in mind is that oftentimes in the winter time, especially if we're expecting our animals to still be producing eggs, we want to provide them uh, with we want to increase their diet a bit because they're expending energy to stay warm and then they're also expending energy if they're laying eggs. So we want to take feeding considerations into account as well. Um, if you are planning on selling eggs or selling meat, and we'll talk about that a little more later on, but do you have a market? Are you, you know, looking to get into chicken so that you could provide um, eggs? And if so, are there already a lot of other people selling eggs? Could you maybe sell, um, you know, eggs that are unique colors, uh, eggs from different classes of poultry, um, you know, just kind of consider your market and, and what might be out there. Um, if you're going to sell meat, there are several um, restrictions and exemptions that I'll briefly mention at the end of this presentation. But especially um, if you're looking at processing on a large scale, there aren't too many processors in Illinois and specifically here in Southern Illinois that handle uh, poultry processing. So be aware of that if, if this is something you're considering. So 
I want to also talk briefly about egg production and just a little bit um, as, as we kind of have been thinking about lately with uh, rising costs and things, are we wanting to get chickens to help supplement our eggs? If that's the case, um, please be aware that hens do not typically start laying eggs until around they are, until they are around 20 weeks old. So we usually, most breeds, we consider them to be mature at about 16 weeks of age, and they may lay an egg or two, um, but usually it's at least another month before they start consistently laying eggs. And even for the first six months or so that they've started laying eggs, they um, might be slightly smaller in size. They might still be a little bit irregular. Um, it takes them a little while to get into the swing of things. So um, if you are purchasing chicks, know that it's going to be somewhere between four and five months before you start getting eggs from your hens. This can be important when we consider when to purchase our chicks as well. Uh, another important thing to keep in mind is that laying hens have very specific diet requirements and they typically require more calcium in their diet so that that way they can put the shell on the egg adequately. So when we are purchasing chickens and going to feed them, we want to make sure that we have a diet that is specifically designed for laying hens if we're going to be using hens for egg production. A another thing that people don't often realize is that hens are born with all of the eggs that they will ever lay. So a hen has a set amount of eggs that she'll lay in a lifetime. Um, it varies a little bit from chicken to chicken and breed as well, um, but typically egg production peaks at around two and a half years um, and then steadily begins to drop off as that hen ages. So chickens can live pretty full lives um, and be, you know, seven, eight years old. Somewhere between five and seven is usually what we say. They can live to be up to 10 years old, probably older than that. But that egg production starts going downhill at three years of age. So keep that in mind. Are you going to be cycling your flock? Are you going to kind of have a retirement um, village for your chickens? What, what kind of plans do you have um, to be able to... Uh, keep these chickens beyond their productive lives? Um, and, or do you do you plan to, to butcher them? Um, and another thing to keep in mind that we don't always think about and can be kind of a rude awakening if it happens, is if you are keeping your chickens out in the open and free ranging them or allowing them to forage, if they are, whatever they are eating can definitely affect the flavor of their eggs. Uh, so in the springtime, Oftentimes, some of the first things that are emerge are like wild onions and garlic, and sometimes that can give like a garlicky or oniony flavor to the eggs. I have seen where we have fed chickens uh, sorghum, and while it didn't really affect the flavor, um, it did kind of uh, change the color of the egg, and it, it did have a kind of a fishy smell to it because it kind of it, it enhanced the availability of um, omega three fatty acids in the, in the egg. So that was an interesting thing that we did and, and, and saw happen. So just keep in mind that chickens, whatever they're eating is kind of going in and gonna flavor, could potentially flavor the egg. So the most common way that people get started with chickens is they want to start with chicks. This can be really fun, especially if you have uh, kids or you just kind of want to start and see the process through from beginning to end. Um, and I'll address these pictures on the on the right side of the screen here in a moment. Um, so the first thing you want to do is to prepare and test your brooder at least 24 hours beforehand. So the brooder is kind of any what we refer to any container that we're going to put our chicks in and keep them there until they start to get feathers and we can transfer them to the next location. So a brooder can be anything from a cardboard box, like a plastic tote, um, kind of like you see at the farm stores where they use like a watering tank. You can use a lot of different items to make a brooder. Uh, one thing you wanna keep in mind is that chicks can't control their body temperatures very well for the first few weeks because they don't have any of their more permanent feathers. They're just kind of covered in that down and they can't 
do a lot to help control their own body temperature. So we want to provide them with a heat source. Um, most common heat source is uh, a lamp with with a hood on it, a heat lamp, um, and you can buy those in several different wattages. We've used the 125s and the 250s. Uh, you can purchase those at pretty much any farm store um, and, and use those. There is a little bit of risk. Sometimes you want to make sure those are secured wells that you don't have any risk of, of a fire hazard or anything like that, but they work quite well and quite easily. So one thing to note is that the positioning of your light is important and the height of your light is important. So for the first week or so, um, the chicks need to be somewhere around 90 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So what you can do to test that is you put your light up, let it be on for a few hours and then put a thermometer underneath of the light and you can see the temperature that it needs to be at. The other thing that I like to do is that if you can, it's important to choose a tub or a container brooder that has kind of rounded edges. Corners are usually bad because you can have chicks like smash against them and stuff. If you need to use a box you, you, with a corner, you can, but I typically recommend something that has kind of rounded edges. My favorite thing is something that is longer than it is wide because we can put the heat lamp in one side and then the chicks can kind of decide what's warm enough for them. You do want to be careful with that. If you have a lot of chicks and they're cold and they can't all get under the light, that's when we can see issues with them trampling and, and laying on each other. So kind of um, adjust that kind of according to, to what your own personal needs are. But this is a really great uh, graphic of what a brooder looks like set up properly. Um, you can see that in the just right circle, this is really nice because the, the light is in the center, um, like I said, I like to put it to one side, but but in this one, it's in the center. Um, and the chicks are kind of evenly all spaced underneath the light. Um, if they're too hot, they will often all go to the very edge to get away from the light. And then sometimes you'll also see them kind of lay out and like spread their wings, trying to distribute their body heat as much as possible to kind of get rid of, of some of that heat. If they're too cold, they'll be really bunched up underneath the light and then sometimes they'll also chirp and make a lot of noise and just be generally uh, distressed. And then if there's a draft in, in um, let's say you put them under a window or something, you'll notice that they'll tend to stay to one side or the other to get away from the draft. Um, and then as they age, you want to slowly acclimate them by raising, um, by reducing the temperature by about five degrees every week until the temp reaches the same temperature as where you're going to be putting them, so around 70-ish degrees. Um, once they mature, they can handle quite a bit, but we don't want to shock their systems by just taking them from 90 degrees to 65. Um, the easiest way to adjust um, temperature is using, like I said, the heat lamps and then just simply raising the heat source up higher will reduce the temperature underneath the light. The other thing, they do make some uh, like heat, um, like brooder kind of shelves and things that the chicks can actually get underneath of to get warm enough. I've never personally used those, but um, there are a lot of good uh, videos and recommendations out there for, for something like that. I have um, kind of in a pinch used like a flat uh, heater that was just kind of placed to the edge of the box to use as well. We only use that for like a day or two and it worked, but it just kind of really crowded our, our brooder. So we, we went back to the lamp. Um, it's very important to provide clean, dry bedding to your chicks, especially when you first get them. Um, there are several different ways to do this and I won't get into all of them, but the most important thing to remember with your bedding is that you want to make sure that it's a surface that the chicks have plenty of traction on. So if you're gonna put newspaper down, I recommend um, using standard newsprint, no slick magazine pages or anything, because if they get wet, they'll, they'll be too slick. And then um, we have access to shredded paper pretty readily. Um, so we put that down as well to help provide some additional traction. Uh, another good option is like, 
uh, shavings, so like cedar shavings or pine shavings or something like that. I would recommend avoiding really finely ground shavings, so no sawdust or anything like that, because sometimes they will get confused and try to eat the bedding instead of the feed, and we don't want that. So um, provide clean, dry bedding to your chicks. Uh, brooder boxes, like I said, should be round or have rounded edges if possible to help prevent them from crowding or smashing into corners. Um, and also kind of just, it's just a much easier system for them, them to understand. But I've, I've kept lots of chicks in, in cardboard boxes and, and not had any issue as long as they're warm enough and have plenty of access to, to food and everything. So these are some different examples of brooders that we've used. Um, the one on the left, the green one, is a mineral tub um from cattle and we had it we only had five chicks so this worked really well it was really small um and these chicks are just a couple days old um they're just starting to get some wing feathers uh, but you can see our thermometer underneath of the light so that way we know what temperature it is directly underneath the light we have our shredded paper um, and i have a really shallow water here because um, especially in larger groups of chicks sometimes deeper waters chicks can fall in um, and get get wet and either drown or just um, have issues because their feathers are wet. So use a shallower water if possible. Um, they also have the ones that hang from above and they, they drink underneath, those work too. Uh, but just make sure that they are drinking and they know where the water is at. On the right, we have um, the same chicks. They're a little bit older. We actually have them out in the shed um, and we have their light secured. Uh, on top, we have a, a cattle panel with chicken wire over the top of it. Part of this was predator protection. The other issue was, as you can see, the chicks were getting on top of the water and we were afraid that they were going to jump or fly out. So we put a lid on them to keep them in there. Um, and they did pretty well in, in that system. So getting chickens. We've talked about you know different ways to raise chicks. And um, if you're going to be sourcing chickens, so whether they are young or old, um, there are several ways to do it. You can order uh, chickens through the mail. Um, the important thing to keep in mind with this is there are a lot of different hatcheries out there. So just do your research and kind of figure out what's going to work best for you. Um, and then if you have questions, call the hatchery and talk to them. Um, if there's a reputable one that's fairly close by, it's a good idea to try to order from them so that way the chicks don't have to travel as far. Um, but just kind of really do your research. The other thing you want to do if you're going to be mail ordering chicks is make sure that your post office knows that they're coming and knows that it's live, knows that there's live animals and that they need to call you as soon as they receive them. And then once you receive them, you need to get over there as, as fast as you can. Uh, baby chicks can go up to three days after hatching without food or water, but after three days, they really need to start getting food and water. Um, and so that um, is why they are able to ship them, but that's why we also need to be very quick in our response time. Um, another thing that you can do is order uh, fertilized eggs. So through the same hatcheries, you can get fertilized eggs. You can also, um, you know, if you want to hatch and incubate eggs, you can find uh, locals in the area that have fertilized eggs that they're willing to either give you or sell to you. Um, hatching your own chicks is very fun, but there is a lot to be learned about it. So um, do your research first if you plan on hatching your own chicks. And, and that's something to take into consideration. The other thing with purchasing fertilized eggs is oftentimes there's no guarantee on live hatch rates. Um, and so, so keep that in mind. Um, another thing that you can do, um, especially if you are concerned about like if you're wanting to have a, a particular breed of chicken or uh, promote certain bloodlines, connecting with reputable breeders of those chickens is, is important to do. Um, also, then that helps you plug into some really good networks and resources. You can also look at getting young hens, so hens that maybe um, we call those pullets that haven't started laying yet or have just started laying. You can purchase, uh, sometimes you can purchase pullets. If you are going to be purchasing mature chickens, make sure that you know 
how old they are or know where they've come from because if you're purchasing older hens as we talked about earlier they may not be laying eggs reliably anymore um so just be very aware of that if you're purchasing adult chickens that you know approximately how old they are um and and just be aware of that um one thing that is nice um, that you can do to, to save a little bit of money and also kind of give you better odds is if you're going to be purchasing chicks from a farm store, if you keep an eye out, sometimes they'll have the older chicks that are starting to get feathers and, and get a little bit, um, they're losing their baby chick cuteness. Um, you can typically purchase those much cheaper. Um, the one drawback is that you kind of are getting whatever's left over. And so you may not have as much choice in like breed. Um, and you usually have to buy them in some quantity. So for example, I recently purchased 25 chicks. Um, I didn't need 25 chicks, but it was very easy to, to, um, get rid of them. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind too, is, is sometimes you can purchase chicks. And then if you don't want that many, you could raise them to be pullets and then sell them to someone else. So there's a lot of different ways to come by, um, acquiring chickens. So keeping poultry, we got our chickens and now we need to figure out what to do with them. Um, so some main considerations that I've kind of talked about um, a little bit before, but to summarize, space. How much space do we have? Uh, do we, you know, chickens are very small, so we don't often think about the space requirement that they may have, but if allowed to, they will roam around a pretty good distance and sometimes they can damage uh, landscaping our yards um, as they scratch and look for bugs or, or forage around. So think about the space that we have and then also the space that we want the chickens to stay in or we want to get them out of. Um, and then the time that we have available. If we are thinking about maybe putting, you know, raising larger quantities of chickens and we want to have them on pasture or have a, a system that requires more intensive management, we want to make sure that we're allowing enough time in our kind of budget for the day to, to make sure we have time for that. Existing enclosures, maybe you already have an old chicken coop on your property or a, uh, a shed or something that you're looking to repurpose. So that kind of gives us a place to start with. And then also your goals. Are you buying chickens? Are you getting chickens because you want to provide eggs to your family and know you know, where your, where your food's coming from, or do you just really enjoy them, uh, you know, looking for an easy project for your kids to get started with. There's a lot of reasons, but we want to understand our goals. And then once we understand our goals, do our goals align with our budget? Because chickens, um, especially up front, can have a decent amount of a cost to them, um, both with, you know, some place to keep them, the chickens themselves, they're going to be requiring feed no matter whether they're laying or not. Um, and so those are some things to keep in mind and, and to kind of help us decide what our best course of action is. Um, again, movable enclosures, which we call chicken tractors, work really well if we're raising broilers or meat chickens um, that require supplemental feed. So these are kind of contained structures, and I have some pictures um coming up but they're contained in structure contained structures that keep the chickens inside of them but still allow us to move them around every day or every couple of days to give them fresh pasture and then also help spread their manure around um, they also make um, and you can find lots of different plans um, out there for building um, a coop on like an old wagon running gear and you can build a movable coop on wheels that are used a lot of times in pasture egg production. So the chickens can be trained pretty easily to return to the safety of the coop at night. Um, typically, they want, um, typically they want to be in that coop anyway um, at nighttime because that's where they get fed, that's where they're safe at. Uh, they like to come back to a familiar place whenever it gets dark. So, I want to talk briefly about housing and protection, especially, um, you know, some big considerations to, to think about. Anytime you have chickens, especially once you have them for a while, 
it seems like you start to attract predators that you didn't even know you had. Um, so first of all, think about predators that you might have in your area that could potentially be there. Um, and then, or if you've had issues in the past, know that those are probably going to emerge once you have a, a food source for them. Um, so in our area here in Southern Illinois, it's really common um, for uh, coyotes, raccoons, uh, weasels, skunks. Um, once in a while, the occasional bobcat might move through. Um, that's going to be a little less frequently. Um, but then also uh, predators from above. So hawks are a big one. Um, you know, there, there's just kind of a, even owls and things sometimes at night can, can bother uh, coops as well. Um, and then depending on your uh, proximity to town, you may have more trouble with like neighborhood dogs or uh, feral cats or anything like that also kind of pestering uh, your chickens. So take into account, you know, anything that you've seen wildlife wise. And that will kind of help you determine what you need to, how sturdily you need to build your, your coop. Um, unfortunately, no matter how well we build, um, sometimes we, we do have problems. Um, and so kind of if you're thinking about building housing, what kind of materials do you have available to you? Do you have on hand? Um, so you can purchase pre-built coops. You can uh, buy used coops. Uh, if you're going that route and going to purchase a used coop, make sure you disinfect it and clean it out really, really well before you introduce your chickens into it just to help uh, stop any spread of disease. Um, we have a fiberglass calf hut because the area that I'm originally from has a few dairies and we bought, uh, I think it was given to us. And so we were able to turn that into a pretty simple coop. Um, there's a lot of different things that you can can do. Um, but some other considerations to think about are, do you plan on moving your coop regularly? If that is the case, you want to make sure that you have it so that you can move it easily or you won't move it. Uh, so maybe building it on skids, putting it on wheels, uh, making it fairly light so you can even drag it by hand if you need to. Just some things to consider. Um, another thing, especially if you're going to build, um, well, really any kind of, of coop, but um, especially a more permanent one, consider your physical abilities or physical abilities of those helping you when you're designing your coop layout. So how do you plan to clean it? Um, if you plan on using a movable coop, it might be okay to have it pretty close to the ground where you can't get inside of it and stand up. But if you're going to be going inside of the chicken coop regularly, you want to make sure that it's comfortable for, for an adult to walk in and stand up and, and move around. Um, to clean it out. A lot of people will build um, access panels and things where they can open up like the whole side of the coop on smaller coops to be able to clean it easily. Um, and again, if you want to go into the coop, make sure you're taking that into consideration. Ours is a person can go inside of it, but you have to stoop and it's just kind of gross and it's not really conducive to going in and out of easily. Um, and then thinking about how you'll collect your eggs will also affect how you're going to be building the, the coop. If it's a walk-in coop where you're going to be going in and taking eggs from the chickens, um, there's a lot of really creative designs for like roll away nest boxes where the eggs, the hens lay the eggs and then the eggs roll gently um, into a collection area. So there's a lot of different options that way as well that you want to kind of think about and do research on if, if you're going to um, do something like that. So this is just an example here um, that I've taken from a, a local farm nearby. Um, a couple of different examples of, of wire for, for chicken uh, enclosures. So the wire here on the left in front of this uh, very angry looking red hen um, is that this is kind of what I would refer to as a rabbit wire. So it's a really small, um, probably like inch by inch or less square. This tends to be a much stiffer, sturdier wire. Uh, very little can get their head through that. So like it's going to eliminate quite a few predators um, and it, it's fairly sturdy. Um, like a large predator, like a dog or something could probably push it aside. I don't know that they could break it down, but they could definitely like 
bend it or uh, potentially come over the top of it. Um, and then on the right side is kind of our standard classic woven chicken wire um, in those octagons. And so what they have done is for the first couple feet, they have put the more stiff rabbit wire along the bottom. And then up towards the top, they've gone with the lighter gauge um, chicken wire. Um, and chicken wire, this kind of octagon shape, it is very, uh, it, it's somewhat flimsy. So I would not use that as like my main line of defense, especially if you have like a heavy, um, like dog pressure, coyote pressure, something like that, where it's going to be a stronger predator pushing on the wire. Uh, and you can see here how, how tall the fence is and then it's secured with, with T-posts. Um, sometimes people will also, if they have trouble with something crawling over the top, they will run a strand of electrical wire across the top of the fencing to help um, discourage predators from coming from the top. Uh, if you have a really heavy hawk issue, which this area is heavily wooded, so they really wouldn't have as many issues. But if you do have a hawk pressure, you can get um, netting that goes over the top as well. Uh, but what I wanted to point out in this picture is that they have a yard that they try to keep the chickens in um, most of the time. And then this is their feeding station. And they also had a grit station here as well that you, you can't see in the picture. But the feeding station here is meant to protect their feed from uh, water. And that helps uh, you know keep the feed good and keeps the animals healthy as well. Um, and then this is the inside portion of their coop. And you can see that they have nest boxes that they can just reach in from the back and they don't even have to go inside of the coop to be able to retrieve um, the eggs. This is another really great example of some um, larger scale chicken tractors, but um, equally effective. So this is from uh, Main Street Pastures uh, over in St. Rose, Illinois. They do a lot of regenerative livestock, but they, and this picture was taken in uh, February. Um, a couple years ago. So this is their um, main chicken tractor that they keep all of their meat birds in. And this is used, um, it's stationary, it was stationary in the wintertime, but otherwise it moves um, at least once a day. And so they have a shade protection, they have a wire on the sides to help protect the animals. And they have wire on the side to help protect the animals and then skids uh, that they can pull with a small tractor or uh, something to help move it. And then the other um, house here is their egg mobile, which is where all their laying hens go. And they pull that with, a, again, with a side by side or some other, um, even a tractor and they pull this. So this was an old um, wagon that they rebuilt into a, a, a hen house. And then again, just some kind of different pictures. This is a smaller version of their chicken tractors that they use as well. So your housing is very flexible, really. And then on the outside here, they have electric netting. Um, we use it here to help protect our chickens and to keep them in. Um, my biggest complaint with it is that sometimes it's a bit awkward to move, but so far it seems to be working pretty well. Um, this is a feeding station, so they have water in this tank and then water that drops down into this delivery, and then they also have feed as well. So even when chickens are out on pasture and able to forage, they still need access to feed, especially if we are expecting something from them. Um, so if we're expecting our hens to keep laying through the winter, we need to feed them appropriately. If we're raising meat birds out on pasture, uh, we need to be feeding them the right amount of protein. So this is, again, just kind of some examples of hanging feeders, and then they've got straw and uh, there are more nest boxes towards the back here. So this is our chicken coop. Um, I use that term somewhat loosely, um, that we keep here at our office in Jackson County. Again, it's just a fiberglass calf hut that I put uh, a wire floor into to help protect against predators. We move this about once a week. Um, and it's more to help distribute the manure evenly than it is uh, for the chickens, because the chickens can, um, up until a few weeks ago, they were free ranging. Now we have them kind of contained. So when we talk about feeding, 
Um, it is very, it is really good to provide um, extra enrichment. So pasture and, and uh, or grass, you know, any foraging that they can do is, is beneficial to them. But they do need um, a couple of things in their diet, no matter what, that it's really important for us to, to provide to them. So one thing is protein. Um, it's key for enzyme pr uh, production, tissue maintenance, and development of egg components. Um, and typically in our uh, commercially available feeds, any feed that we're providing to our chicken needs to have some form of protein in it. Commercially available feeds typically have um, <clears throat> Uh, one of the most common feedstuffs is soybean meal. It's pretty high in protein. Um, oftentimes, unless the feed is specifically labeled as vegetarian, it does, for chickens, it does have, um, it can have some component of animal or animal byproduct in it. Um, and then when we think about out in nature, often chickens are getting some of their protein from insects or very small mammals, um, you know, things like that that they can um, eat. Uh, to help supplement their diet. Then energy, um, usually in the forms of carbohydrates and lipids. So for carbohydrates in commercial feed, it's going to most likely be corn, um, but we could also use other starchy, starch rich grains um, to help supplement that as well. And then lipids would be our fats. So any of our vegetable oil fats, um, some, some nuts and seeds have pretty high oil content, so that's a, a good option. Um, also, animal fats is another one. Um, and then vitamins and minerals. Uh, chickens have a wide variety of vitamins and minerals that they require in their diet, but the two most important ones are calcium and phosphorus. And we call those two best friends because chickens need the calcium, but they are unable to absorb it properly without phosphorus in their diet. So Calcium is incredibly important for eggshell development and the phosphorus is needed to help metabolize the calcium in their bodies appropriately to develop the eggshells. Um, typically, we need to provide them with a calcium and phosphorus source that is in a four to one ratio um, up to a seven to one ratio for laying hens. So that's very important to keep in mind when we're looking at food labels or if we're gonna venture into maybe mixing our own feeds, we wanna keep in mind that these are the essentials that chickens need. So when we're looking in general at feed sources, um, starting out with chicks, um, generally they need the highest level of protein as chicks, um, somewhere around that 20 to 22% protein level um, from zero to six weeks. As they start to get a little older, um, we can switch them to um, what we call like a pullet grower, which would be like a hen grower uh, from 14 to 16 uh, percent protein. And that's going to be in that six to 20 week range. Um, and then layer feeds are going to be for our laying hens. They have a decently high um, protein level, especially in comparison to our all purpose feed. Um, so we want to provide our hens with a decently high protein level so that they have enough energy and the proper nutrients to be able to lay eggs. So feeding for egg production. Laying hens are going to be, again, fed much differently than meat birds and chicks. Uh, they require more calcium in their diets, and then uh, whereas young chicks require more protein and growth. So I, I want to stress this point that if you're starting with chicks, get them a chick starter feed because they're going to require the protein in that to help develop their muscles correctly. And if we start with a layer feed for chicks that has too much calcium in it and it can disrupt um, their bone and structural development. So chick feed for chicks and then once they reach the appropriate age, transition them to a layer pellet. Free range birds, so um, chickens that have access to forage can supplement up to 20% of their diet on the food that they find, but we do still wanna make sure that we are providing them with the opportunity to get um, another food source, um, whether that's a, a kind of conventional commercially available source or one that we make ourselves. Um, so again, eggs, we want to be careful with that because of the off flavoring that they can develop. Um, 
this does flow into uh, into our breed selection, but choose breeds that are suitable for egg production if that's what you're looking for, because they will eat less feed and be more productive than birds bred for meat production. Birds bred for meat production are um, eating with the kind of goal of putting on muscle and bulk, where egg layers are putting the majority of their energy into egg production. Um, for any and all purposes, choose feed that's good quality and that suits your needs. So just a couple of troubleshooting um, feed considerations. Water quality and availability are directly related to food consumption and then by extension, egg production. So we wanna make sure that we are providing clean, uh, good quality water every day to our chickens and that, um, you know, that it's in good quality and always available because that relates to their food consumption um, as well. Uh, feeders need to be the right size and spaced appropriately within your chicken area. So that way everyone has the opportunity to eat and there's not um, any issues or fighting because of not having enough space to get to the feeders. Um, I just briefly mentioned vegetarian feeds. Um, some feeds that you purchase um, can be, um, uh, would be labeled as vegetarian. They don't contain any animal products at all. Um, I just bring that up to say that there are lots of different options for chickens and chickens are not by nature vegetarian. They are actually omnivorous. Um, so scratch grains and treats are good in moderation, but we often think about these kind of like dessert before uh, a meal. So if you're going to be providing grains and treats, um, you want to provide that separately. And then if it's possible, provide it after they've already been fed um, their standard meal because it takes up space in their gizzards and we want them to be able to be getting the main nutrients from the feed uh, first. Um, as long as you are feeding a properly labeled layer pellet designed for your chickens to lay, you do not need supplemental calcium uh, as long as you're feeding a complete layer feed. So the cal all the calcium that they need is already in that feed. Um, and you don't need to give them um, choice of like oyster shells or be feeding their shells back to them or anything like that because they can't put on more calcium than what they're like genetically predisposed to do when they're making their egg shells. So if you think, you know, if the animals are foraging heavily or you're trying to vary their diet quite a bit, so you're not relying on a complete feed, then you may want to put out some uh, supplemental calcium, but otherwise you don't need it. Uh, grit, which is, um, you know, kind of like a sand, um, is first of all different than supplemental calcium. And second of all, um, typically we only need to provide it if the animals are foraging um, or receiving scratch grains. So the complete feeds that you purchase that are either the pellets or the crumbles are pretty well already digested. So grit's not essential. Um, and a lot of times if animals are foraging, they're gonna be picking up sand and rocks and things anyway. Um, another thing to keep in mind if you're keeping a rooster with your laying hens is that they can be at a slightly increased uh, risk of kidney issues due to the high nutrient composition, um, specifically the calcium. So if you are just have a rooster or two kind of around for protection, um, you know, they'll probably be fine. We've not had any problems with ours, but if you are raising, you know, roosters and you wanna, um, you're raising them for a specific purpose, um, or maybe you have show stock or something like that, you might consider keeping your roosters and hens separate so that you can feed the roosters the diet that they need. So very briefly, this is just kind of an example of um, pasturing poultry and, and how, how that would be done. Uh, breed selection. So it's important to choose what works for you. Um, think about the eggs per year that you might be interested in, um, lifespan of the, of, of the birds that you're getting. Uh, some breeds tend to live longer than others. Some breeds are kind of intended to be very short-lived breeds. 
uh, broodiness, which is the tendency to sit on a clutch of eggs and try to hatch them out. Uh, some people, um, broodiness is, is what they want. But also keep in mind that once a hen starts to be broody, she's typically not laying eggs. She's, she's setting on them and she's intending to hatch chicks. So keep that in mind. Um, mature size and weight. Uh, how large do you want them to be? Um, you know, just being very aware of that. Um, body size also does somewhat dictate egg size as well. Uh, egg color. Do you have a particular uh, color of egg that you like? Um, despite popular belief, um, the color of the outside of the eggshell does not affect the flavor or nutrient content or anything of the egg inside the shell. Uh, so color of eggs is kind of our own personal preference. And then time to maturity. If we're raising meat birds, uh, this becomes very important. Um, and then docility. Um, I say that this is kind of a double-edged sword. If we are going to um, kind of more closely manage our birds and provide lots of uh, protection and we're gonna be around them all the time, we may want them to be more calm, more gentle, easier to handle. If we're gonna be free ranging our birds and they're gonna kind of be on their own and need to take care of themselves, we may wanna look at selecting a breed that is a little more agile, more alert, maybe a little more skittish so that they can be aware of, of predators and, and do a good job of protecting themselves. So this is a screen grab from Cackle Hatchery. Uh, we don't support one hatchery over another, but this is just um, a really great example of some things and information that you can find on hatchery websites if you're looking at them. So I want to point over here to the breed facts about this breed. This is a barred rock. Um, but a couple of things to know is they say their primary purpose, which is egg laying, and then secondary as a meat source, uh, their eggshell color, uh, production. So this is the number you'd want to look at um, if you're choosing a particular breed. There are other websites. Um, the uh, Livestock Conservancy, which does a lot of work for heritage breeds, uh, they have some really great fact sheets out there about eggs and egg production uh, per breed. Um, and then also their temperament. So these tend to be a much more active breed um, and they do tend to want to set. So something to keep in mind um, and to watch for. Again, this is, so this is Murray McMurray Hatchery um, and has a very similar uh, kind of website. I believe I had um, a buff coaching or something pulled up here as, as the breed. Um, but then it says, uh, another thing to note from this particular website is their heat tolerance. So they typically do not free range well, and um, they don't tolerate heat very well because they tend to be a very heavy, very feathered bird. So something to keep in mind. Um, and they tend to do better for meat production. Um, and then these are their weeks to maturity. So when I mentioned heritage poultry, um, I just kind of want to briefly go over it um, because heritage birds can be a really great way to distinguish yourself um, and, they're, and they're a lot of fun. Um, so APA is American Poultry Association and um, they have a lot of really good information on their website about chickens as well. Um, and these are just a little bit about the, the breed standards um, and what breeds would be classified as a heritage poultry breed. So one thing to keep in mind is that if you're going to purchase heritage birds and you want to make sure that they're heritage, they need to be able to mate and reproduce naturally um, and then have long productive lifespans. So heritage birds tend to be very vigorous. Um, they thrive well outdoors. They're capable of foraging. Their hens typically have decently long lifespans. Um, heritage birds tend to produce longer into their lives. So these chickens you might see laying eggs much longer than some of our other breeds of chickens. They are typically slower growing. So for um, market production, um, for, for harvest, they're gonna be 16 weeks or so. So I wanna point out um, a couple of things. These are two different body types. The bird on the left is a Cornish style or game bird style. Um, and they typically are large, heavily muscled, heavy bodied um, birds. And they're noted for their like table bird quality or, or butchering quality. So these birds and chickens that look kind of like them are going to be slaughtered 
for meat consumption. The chicken on the right, which I realize is a rooster, <laughs> is uh, what we are looking for in our egg laying types. So the hens are also going to be a much lighter build, much smaller, um, what we call the non-industrial leghorn type. So these are going to be, you know, like I said, lighter, more erect type of birds as well. They're going to stand up a little straighter and have a more erect body style. Um, and they are typically, um, a lot of birds that fall into this classification are going to be small, hardy birds that lay anywhere from 150 to 300 eggs a year, depending on the breed. So that's kind of what we're looking at overall. And then I talked about heritage, but I also want to mention hybrid and sex length. So hybrids are just a cross between two different um, breeds of chickens. Um, a lot of times we see this in egg laying for their um, egg coloring ability. So olive eggers are a cross of two different chickens that um, one produces typically a blue or a green egg and the other one is typically um, of the, the French uh, copper morans or the French black copper morans and they have um, they have a very dark brown egg, but the unique thing about them is they finish with kind of a, almost like a spray coating on the outside of the egg. And so when you cross the two, you get the coating on the green egg and that's what results your olive eggger. Um, and so that's um, another reason. And then also Easter eggers are kind of a cross um, of a several different Aracana breeds to create, um, you know, eggs that are green, pink, blue, um, and kind of have really pretty egg. Uh, production. Another reason we might hybridize is to produce faster maturing meat birds with heavier muscling. Um, and then I also want to note um, the term sex linked means that we cross two different breeds together with the purpose of producing chicks that are born different colors based on the sex that they are. So I have a really great picture from Cackle Hatchery. Um, and these are black sex links, sex linked chicks. Uh, and the males are all born with this white dot on their head and the females are solid black. So what this does is this makes it really easy for us to determine whether they're males or females. And then um, there are a couple different breeds that do this as well. Um, and it makes it very accurate to select hens if, if that's what you're purchasing, um, you're wanting to get hens, it's very easy to tell. Um, so that's a, an interesting uh, tip to keep in mind. Um, so one breed, um, and this is both, um, you can find, um, so a Dominique is one of the, you know, kind of uh, America's first breed of chicken as they're kind of recognized. Um, they're very good dual purpose chicken, um, kind of a larger body style, um, but they have medium sized eggs and they can lay anywhere between 230 to 275 eggs a year. Um, and they really do well in you know, most climates, they're, they're pretty suitable. Osterlorps, um, they tend to be sometimes a little bigger bodied, especially the, the roosters. Um, I put them in here because they, um, a hen broke the world record of laying 364 eggs in 365 days. That's not gonna happen every time, uh, but they are very productive egg layers. Um, again, dual purpose, um, brown eggs, and then anywhere from 250 to 300 eggs a year. They're very productive and they tend to grow pretty rapidly and, and mature quickly. Um, and I put in um, Langshan because this is kind of what I was, um, they have a very unique egg color, but then also something to keep in mind and take note of when we're looking at chickens is that these are, tend to be a little more skittish and they fly really well. So they can jump and fly over fences pretty easily. So um, just something to keep in mind when you're looking at breeds is that that's something to take into account is do they have any particular characteristic that might make them more or less desirable for us? Um, black sex links. So we actually just purchased some of these. Um, uh, my family and I did, um, we got them. We also have, um, ISA Browns, which are another sex link um, chicken as well. Um, but they are created by crossing a Rhode Island red rooster and a barred rock hen. Um, and they are very, um, they're bred to be non-setter. So they lay eggs and they don't typically sit on them. 
Um, and then the, the cockerels or the young roosters can be butchered for meat. Um, and they range in that 200 to 280 eggs per year, which is really very good. Um, and then the Easter eggers, um, mixed Aricana lines. So there are some Aricana lines that are uh, bred to lay a particular color, but they typically these mixed, the Easter eggers lay multiple colors of eggs. Typically each chicken only lays one color. So you won't have one hen that lays pink eggs one day and blue eggs the next. It's always going to be she's laying pink eggs, she's laying blue eggs, she's laying green eggs, like one for each one. So if you want to increase your chances, get a bunch of them. Um, they are really fun. Uh, they're very docile, um, friendly chickens. Once in a while, we'll get one that they tend to be um, more broody, uh, but they're, they're a lot of fun and they're, they're one of my favorites. Um, and then the meat birds. Overall, um, there are some different crosses, but if you're looking at chicks, um, most common one you're going to see is the Jumbo Cornish Cross, which is this one up here in the top left. Um, and they typically are lightly feathered. Um, they're known for their very large um, chest muscles, um, bred specifically for meat production to grow very rapidly. They can reach a market weight of six and a half pounds at eight weeks of age. Um, and we do want to take note that typically, especially the Jumbo Cornish or any of the Cornish crosses, we are going to want to butcher those. They, they don't lay eggs well. Um, they tend to have health issues beyond the recommended harvest age. Um, so they are specifically for meat production. Uh, Freedom Rangers are kind of a cross between a couple of different breeds. So they're kind of a compromise between a heritage chicken and the Cornish cross. So they are active and robust. They're the red ones up here in the top right corner. Um, and um, they have a moderate growth rate. So they'll hit five and a half to six pounds anywhere between nine and 12 weeks, depending on conditions. Um, and then the bottom is uh, the dark Cornish. So they're a heritage meat bird. They're kind of um, that traditional game bird that the Cornish crosses were developed from. Uh, but they tend to be uh, free ranging, skittish. The hens will lay eggs um, and you could keep them around continually, um, but they are intended, they're a heavier muscling bird um, intended for meat production. And they have a much slower growth rate. Um, they hit maturity at about 18 weeks for harvest weight. Um, I wanna briefly mention selling poultry products. So meat can be more complicated and strict than egg sales, but it is doable. There are some exemptions. Um, you can slaughter and process your own animals for your own consumption. So that's not an issue. You don't need anything special for that. Um, make sure you're following sanitary practices, but you can um, do that. And also be aware in any instances, both keeping chickens and slaughtering them, that if you live in or near a town, check with your town and city ordinances before you go down the road of getting chickens. So meat sold to the public must be processed by the correct type of locker plant. So there's different grades. Um, check out those rules. Illinois Department of Agriculture has a lot of information as well as um, the USDA. Um, so IDOA is um, Illinois Department of Ag for inspection and rules. They have a lot of information. They can help you out. Um, Illinois Department of Ag also has rules and regulations for eggs. So nest run um, typically requires no license. They must be sold on the premises directly to household consumers. So um, be, be aware of these rules if you're considering um, you know, selling any eggs. Um, a limited license uh, requires um, if you plan to sell off premises. So if you're going to take them to the farmer's market or sell them to someone, you need to have a limited license. They're pretty easy to come by. Again, check the IDOA. Uh, less than 3,000 birds uh, must be graded and meet all uh, requirements of the Illinois Egg and Egg Production Act. Find that information on Department of Ag. Um, a full license is more than 3,000 birds, and that comes with um, more uh, regulations and uh, restrictions, and I would definitely recommend looking into that. So this is the Illinois poultry raisers exemption. Um, 
consult with your local state meat inspector, but this exemption um, can be used if you are, um, you can get this for two years if you are going to be butchering 5,000 or less birds in that two year time. You need to um, look into this and do your research before you start doing this, but this is something that can help out smaller producers. Um, but that is, um, Illinois Department of Ag has quite a bit of information on that. Um, and I would highly recommend contacting them first. Uh, these are a lot of great organizations um, and education that can be available. Uh, as I said, um, Livestock Conservancy has a lot of great information on both heritage, per, heritage birds and also just um, keeping chickens at home. Uh, and there's just a lot of really great um, information out there. So. My name is Jill Vondar, if you haven't heard already. So my husband, Chad, and I, and our kiddos there, we run Main Street Pastures. Uh, we have pasture-raised poultry, both egg layers and meat birds. Uh, we do turkey seasonally, um, beef, pork, um, and, and a few lambs, and a few lambs. So um, we sell off our farm, at a farm store here. We do lots of markets, we host, 4-H groups, uh, field trips, that sort of thing. We love to share our story and, and get people to see where their food come, come from. And I was once like all you guys, you know, that young chicken person that uh, was just it, had a few chickens in the backyard. And after about 10 years, here we are. So I'm going to share a lot of pictures with you and feel free to put some questions out. I'll answer them when I'm done. So here's some of our pictures in the pasture. On the top, there's our older egg mobile. That's the one we first started with and move them out to pasture. Uh, we do lots of cover crops with our, with our grains. Um, so then seasonally, I have lots of pasture to use up. So this was a spring field. We were in our egg layers there for about a month before we went and planted corn in that particular field. Um, over here to the right, that is, was our prairie schooner. Those are meat birds. When they're first out on pasture, there's drinkers on the right-hand side and uh, feeders on the left-hand side. And that pen moved every day, sometimes twice a day, depending on the age of the birds and their needs of what the pasture looked like and all that. So um, starting out, I know Katie hit on a lot of these topics, but I'll tell you the story of my first 12 chicks. So we went, I it was either Buckeyes or, or Rogue King, one of the two. And I, we got, I think it was, you know, 24 chicks, you know, and two different breeds of, I had to trust whatever they had posted on there. And we came home and I had 12 of the chicks doing great. And then I had 12 of the chicks, they were huge and they were uh, plump and they lived a few months and then they started dying off. And in my experience now, I can say that those were actually Cornish cross chickens and somebody had mixed them in the pen with what were supposed to be egg layers. So anyway, so that was my first uh, learning curve. <laughs> so research on breeds, know your breeds, that's going to depend on a lot. A heritage breed is going to have probably a little bit longer of a lifespan, typically not lay quite as many eggs as a hybrid, but might be a better better choice for, you know, a backyard flock if you want them to lay, you know, uh, uh, eggs longer in time and be a little, little bit more um, hardy of a bird, if that makes sense. You know, they're, they're used to it versus a hybrid that's just meant to lay lots of eggs and then decline really, really fast. So um, housing obviously is a big concern. You know, you bring the chicks home in a little box and they can live in that little box for a while and that's great, but then what? You know, as they grow, you have to meet their demands um, and, and feed. Um, have, make sure that you have a good feed source for, and, and Katie touched on all the protein sources and all that. Um, the, another learning curve for us was a predator load. Know what predators you have in your area. Um, how you're going to pr protect your flock. Um, we have two great Pyrenees now. We had had um, fox over the years. We had mink that would squeeze through a one by two hole. I'm not kidding. You know, as the small as the size of a doorknob, they could fit through and they could decimate your flock. So know what predators that you're facing 
kind of even I even know like the predator load in our area like when it's like mating season they're going to be roaming around a little bit more if that makes sense and so I'm always a little bit more aware of of a uh, you know okay it's about it's about mink mating season or it's um, the coons are out or or whatever it might be so those are all important things so here's a bunch of our broilers is my little guy in the middle um different housing you know we raise ours outside on the pasture these are some of our pens you can kind of see the inside those were homemade pens um you know uh tarp from silage tarp is what we use and then the bottom curtains can kind of open and close um the biggest thing with these birds with cornish cross is they cannot handle wet and cold they are a very um uh not a hardy breed i should say um they don't they don't do well if they get too too cold they don't do well in in the too hot um so we're only raising these in the warmer months uh, i have a few in the brooder now but we'll really kick it in gear kind of uh may and and then run all the way through september ish um and you know we even take a little bit of a break in august when it's too hot because they they can succumb to the to heat and temperatures is a, is a big um, concern for Cornish cross. Um, we do process our own. We have the poultry exemption license. Um, it's a all hands on deck. Um, we started with just 50 chickens in the backyard at Cornish cross and we raised them for family and friends and we borrowed a plucker and it was a you know Sunday afternoon and everybody came over and helped um, and you know that was one that was several years ago and right now we're we're butchering about in the summertime when everything's up and running about 80 a week um and processing those here on the farm you know and it's it's all hands on deck all my kids are involved um we'll process one afternoon they'll sit in the in the chill tank and then we'll package them the following day so um here i don't know if this gonna let me do this here is a video of our schooner actually being moved if you can see it so at the birds of this size we were probably moving them twice a day and you can see the smart ones are up in the front um, and they're catching all the bugs and getting the fresh grass as it comes up and my kiddos are in the back there kind of making sure that everybody's moving and with the program that nobody gets stuck under the back in the gate in the back end so Um, layers, I'll move on to layers. I know you guys probably have a lot more questions, but I'll move on to our layers. And we, our first pen for our layers was an old garden shed um, that we had set on the property. I didn't have a whole lot in it. And we put nesting boxes on the exterior with a flap. Luckily my husband's pretty handy. Um, we ended up eventually adding a run to the outside of it, um, but it was a safe place. Um, we were able to let them run during the day and then it was a safe place to close them up at night and lay their eggs in there and and all that but you know the little pen on the on the left of your screen there with these hens I mean something like this I think there was two nesting boxes in that but it was it had wheels and you could move that around the yard and so I did use that um, for bigger hens at first but then I just used it to help train pullets to get them used to the outside you can see them on the on the inside of the pen there and they're kind of uh, getting to know one another um, before they were all getting put together as, in one flock. And this was a, a bigger shed that we transformed in our coop, into our coop. Um, roosting bars are important and I would, my recommendation would be to not have the roosting bars over top of where they're nesting. Chickens poop a lot at night and so this whole area underneath of here is going to be full of poop because um, that's, that's, that's where they're sleeping all night long. And then the, the nesting box were off, were off to the side there. And this shed, we open the doors during the day and um, let them roam, and then we pen them up at night. Um, currently, this is my brooder now, so because we graduated. So the pen that you see on the right-hand side is my egg mobile. Um, it fits 650 layers, I believe, and that's that's about what we're running every year. About you know, it's going to fluctuate a little bit if I got young ones on or, or old ones on hand. Um, but we run about 600 in there. It has automatic feeders, drinkers, nest, roll out nesting boxes. But we move this through the pasture typically every other day, unless it's too wet or um, other conditions. But typically every other day, they get a fresh spot. 
that they're eating. And, and we really see a big difference on the, if the pastures are fresh and low um, and their feed consumption. Um, resources of things that, that I uh, would recommend that I look for. Um, there's a lady called Lisa Steele. She does fresh eggs daily. She even has a show on, but she has some books out. She's been a great resource for, for backyard, more of a homesteading uh, style of size of a, of a flock. Um, Polyface Farms, Joe Salatin, I don't know if you've, he's, he's been a pioneer in, uh, in ho not only homesteading, but, pa but pasture raised. Um, Jeff Maddox was, would be a good resource. I know someone was asking about uh, health issues. Jeff has some great books out there for health issues. It would go down and say, you know, this is what the problem is. Um, look into this, this, and this. Um, but he's a great resource for feed and for illnesses and chickens. Um, local hatcheries, I will have to, to say that when, if you're ordering chicks through the mail, you're going to want the closer, the better. So if you can find a hatchery that's, you know, within just three, four hours of you and not across the country, those chicks are going to arrive to you in the morning, you know, rare and go, and they didn't have to such long travel time, you know, they're going to be more, more uh, active. They're going to be easier to, to get going um, because it is shipping stress is a thing. I know last summer we had some issues in the, in the heat of the summer, um, problems with with mail and I my my thought is that they're actually sitting on the runway because the plane the planes were a lot of the planes were delayed so anything that had to hit an airplane for me last year was a little bit stressed by the time it got here so the closer the hatchery that you can get if you're shipping chicks the better I've listed two there that we use Meyer hatcheries in Ohio and cackle hatchery I think was uh, mentioned previously they're in Missouri um, I visited there uh, several times if we're on, traveling on the way, way through, they're, they're pretty good. Um, the other resource that I would suggest is the APA, um, and they have a great um, blog, and they have questions, and they even have a, a big uh, group for homesteaders now, too, that not just large poultry operations. They have, you know, they've, uh, um, they've brought in the horizon and... Um, you know, even a backyard flock can get a lot from that. We've been to several of their conventions, but they put out newsletters and things of that nature to help with. Thank you for joining us this evening for our backyard chicken production webinar. And a special thanks to our guest, Jill Vonderhaar, for sharing her experience on her farm. If you have specific questions, please reach out to Katie Bell at the contact information listed below.